Okay, Raymond Puzo on post sets, extensions, properties, and completions with Gershom Burz. Go, go. So, yes, so the width is because this is based on some joint work Gershom and I are doing, which had to do with um, dependency structures and the process of doing that. To, Sort of problem from computer science. We, you know, in, as a lot of things, computer science involves some order theory, and basically we had there some sort of thing for the post center that I lattice, but we needed for various reasons to com complete it into a distributive lattice. And so, in the process of figuring out how to do that, we wound up, you know, studying a bit about the theory of, of lattices, distributed lattices, etc. And um, finding out and developed a certain point of view on it, which we thought might be, you know, of interest and, and some helped us to improve some results and suggest maybe different ways of thinking about the subject. So I guess the starting point, let me, you know, we'll start with post sets so we all know what they are. They're just, you know, either in the sort of, you know, elementary version, well, they're set where I have an ordering relation, or in our version, well, there's a category where the Homs are and you know have only one element or enriched over the set zero one if you like so all right and then there are special cap classes of post sets so start with of course well, just any old post set but then one special thing is let's say just to to build up slowly is a bounded one just meaning let's say every element has say an upper bound or lower bound in a way, then and this will actually start turning into a big table in the course of my talk, but lattice is moving more special. Then we can have and on the distributive lattice. Yeah, just a, a bounded post it means Yes, what? I'm gonna, yeah, now I'm about to oh, okay, define right. all of them. Oh, okay. So, in fact, the part of the talk will be actually defining them several different ways. So, first, let me just say, yes, so what they are. So, first, I'm going to let me define them by giving the extra axiom in each case that I need to add. So, here, what I'm saying is that, let's say, for all. So I just my bound is that given any two elements, there must they have a bound, lower bound. And so there the, I'm just saying, yeah, for all A and all B, there exists a C which is less than A and less less than equal A or less than equal to B. Alright. Then for a lattice, it's I don't just want the bound, I want the thing to be you know, um, least, you know, least upper, well, least upper bound and greatest lower bound, not just any old bound, so let's write them that, let's one of them down. What I'm saying here is that, again, I have for all any two points, can I call them x and y, you know, there is a going to be, all right, so what happens is that there exists a z so that whenever I have a lower bound here, in addition, it must be less than z, which is then the, you know, greatest lower bound. You sure it's not for all w? Oh, thank you. It is. And it wasn't in that. That was my. I copied it wrong. And then there's a dual thing for, for at least upper bound. So I'll just write one of them. All 
right? So if we have this, you know, for that would be a meet semi lattice. But don't you have to write that z is a lower bound? You do. Well, it follows from this. I mean, z is a lower bound because w is less than both. Okay, and z is, okay, let me just say that. Sure. Just to be safe, let me. Doesn't hurt to make that explicit. Okay, you might be. All right, so just let's make it explicit. So I have the least, the z, which is the least one. Or, or you could just give it if and only if, right? I'm yeah, okay, I could fix it up that way. Yeah. Thank you. That's it, even. So now I have both belt and suspenders, so it definitely works. All right? So that's, you know, the extra law that I added to make the thing a lattice. Well, this and the dual, I should, to be a lattice, I should have the dual thing for the, with, with the arrows reversed, but I won't write that down for now. So it's just say semi lattice if you like. Anyway, then for modular lattice just means now I have, I had yet another axiom, dedicated modular axiom, so you just write that down. algebraic identity and needs to be satisfied when x is less than z. And the best way I think of describing this identity is a special case of the distributive identity, which I will now write next. So automatically imply that join is true to meet. So unlike in the lattice where I didn't write one of the two laws down here, I actually don't need to write the other one down because I could derive it. As I said, when we understand the modular law, is it that it only distributes in the special case where x is less than z. Whereas here, for any x, y, and z, without any restrictions on x and z, it must distribute. So, all right, so those are the special kinds of lattices that have come up, you know, historically, and since I have more time, I was going to say... Well, there there is a point, which I know we used it somewhere, okay. uh, that where mm -hmm. uh, under, I think, a modest assumption like boundedness or something, mm -hmm. right, um, yeah. right, uh, there, uh, a jointness for uh, post means that if, you're right. if half the lattice identity is filled, then the other half is also... No, you're absolutely... So you actually don't need no, it. No, you're absolutely yeah. right. If we're dealing with, say, finite lattices, yeah. or in fact, complete lattices, yeah then in fact, yes, having joints will automatically get meets, and actually, in what, in second I'm going to do in a little bit, in a different characterization, one will see that. That's one this was just yeah. for the, yeah, this was how it's being more formal of saying which axioms. But you're right, in that case, in fact, yes, I can actually get away with mm -hmm. half of them in the finite case, and I guess let me make that disclaimer now. Obviously, a lot of order theory one's interested in, you know, infinite order sets, but in what I'm doing, I'm mostly we are mostly focusing for now on just finite ones. Some of the things we, you know, state will generalize the infinite case, and that should be mentioned, but we're not, especially in that, we'll, we're just happy to do what we do with finite ones, to understand them better in that case. So I should just make that disclaimer. So now, um, since I have more time here, I just wanted to say a little bit about, you know, where, where these things arise in actual practice. So, couple of fields, let's start with logic. So basically in logic, you know, you usually want this because you would think of, you know, in your lattice, these, you would think of these as your and and your or. And basically to get a sensible logic out, one typically wants a distributive law. And so, you know, a little later that's why we're 
why we were, you know, one of the reasons in the work I was doing Gershom was what we did with our event structures. We wanted to have a good logic for them. That's why we wanted to make them distributed if they weren't distributive already. All right, so that's in logic. However, let me mention in areas of math, some of the things where they showed up, especially explaining this somewhat mysterious, perhaps looking modular law. So, um, if you think geometrically, well, let's just start, yeah, geometrically and algebraically, Warren, that you can think of this trivial law, one way of thinking about it is that if you do topology, you have lattice of open sets. So let me just say, I'll do that also over here. Okay. Perfect, right? Okay, so. Topology, you want to have you know, a lattice of open sets. And those form a distributive lattice. And in fact, there's actually, well, okay. So those are, would be one example. And in fact, in other way of thinking that, you know, they might ask, well, all right, so that's one case. Now, it turns out for the modular law, one of the things you can show is that, let's say if I take different algebraic structures, say, let me look at, say, perhaps subgroups or so that's going to be distributed. In rings, those tend to form modular less. In fact, that's why Denik invented the modular one, call it modular, because if you look at modules over rings, that's the extra structure they have. There's also a really rich source of examples mm -hmm. where you um, have a Melchef theory. So, okay. Yeah. Not familiar with those. Okay. So hiding algebras. Uh -huh. in sure. groups. Um, okay. They have. Um, there's a ternary mm -hmm. term which sort of defines what is meant by Melchef theory. But okay. Now I have at least no sign about what Melchef theory is. Oh. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So yeah. So now the point is this is you know algebraically we have this. But on the, I mean, on the geometric side, these would then correspond to subvarieties, let's say algebraic surfaces and curves in your space. So the idea is that if you take, you know, in topology we have the open sets. In algebraic geometry, we have more special things which are nice algebraic sets. And if you take the algebraic sets, the varieties, you know, they have, well, mean joint to intersect them in union, and under that, they form a modular lattice. So in some sense, because they're, it's really, the varieties are, you know, let's say just simple indicate, well, just good old, simple, plain old affine varieties. The, cat, you know, category, those are just the, the category of rings with the arrows reversed. So the same lattice viewed upside down. So it's still modular. And that's, so that's a geometric interpretation. So somehow, you know, somehow one can think of anything that, you know, studying mod, as Rhoda, pointed out, you can really think of studying modular things as a very abstract, for, really abstract form of, al of algebraic geometry. In the same sense that these things are topology. So that gives at least, you know, sorts of examples and what this means. Try what I hope so, uh, means, you know, what it can mean geometrically and hopefully where some of this may then be of interest. So. Can I give you one yeah. other example? Sure, please. Qu quantum logic is modular, not that, distributed. That's, yes. Okay. Right, in fact, it's a special from called orthomodular, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Sure. That's right. Because again, there you're dealing with subspace, in that case, subspaces of a complex vector space. Okay. Which is just, you know, special case of algebraic geometry where your equations are one-dimensional. Well, speaking of Rhoda, he also mentions um, lattices of commuting equivalence relations as another huge source of example. Ah, yes, sure, sure. Yeah, I haven't even, that's right. That's right, he was big on it. Well, of course, that's going to start relating a little bit. I don't know if it, because David Elmer has done things I know with the, with, with, with equivalence with, relations. Yeah, equivalence relations extending Rhoda's work. I don't know if that's what he's talking about this year, though. But could he call some linear lattices or something? Perhaps, yeah. So, all right. So now what I wanted to do was, like I said, I'm actually turning this into a kind of table. So here I put, let's say, 
mm, which kind of pose set, and here I have mine. So this is just the axiom. I, you know, whatever my formula in logic, first our logic defines a thing, but it turns out there's a quite different way of defining these things, a more geometric way by forbidden configuration. So let me mention that in a sort of historical order. So originally, you know, as I said, Dedekind introduced the modular law because that's what characterized lattices coming up in algebra. But he also noticed that in addition to this you know, axiom, there's a completely different way of describing it. He said, suppose I have a lattice. And OK, here's a particular lattice, five points. And suppose that satisfying this modular law, turns out he showed is equivalent to not having any sublattice, this appear as a sublattice anywhere. So instead of an algebraic law, we have this completely geometrical description of it. All right? And then, you know, somewhat later, um, Burkhoff generalized and showed that, well, distributive thing, as we know, is obviously modular is a special case of distributive. And if you want the thing to be distributive, then if it's already modular, <coughs> the extra thing we need to impose is that this can also not occur as a sublattice. So, not just as, all right, if that's the case, then it will be distributed. And with these simpler examples, we can, at least for pedagogical reasons, formulate them that way too. And now I'm going to get actually, so in the case of the lattice, and this gets back to the thing I said a few minutes ago, let me say, suppose I have a pose set in which I have, you know, this sub pose set. So I have two points here. Let's say distinct points for a moment. And two are distinct points such that each of the top points is bigger than each of the bottom points. But I know, don't have any point that lies in between both of these and both of these. Then that thing, you know, that is what cannot happen in a lattice. So the post set, you know, is not a lattice if I can find points like that have where these two top, they're bigger than the two bottom, each of the two bottom, but there's no point in between. Them. And the symmetry of this is basically, right, this figure is obviously symmetric under inverting it. And that's basically what we were saying a few minutes ago about why saying the finite case, having joins gives you meets. Because you see, if I think of it this way, let's say I wanted to find the join of the bottom two points. Well, I couldn't do it if I had these two things, because I'd have upper bounds, but none of them is the least upper bound. Likewise, you know, looking at the thing the other way, well, if I had these two points, I couldn't find a meet of them, because I'd have two lower bounds, but none of them is, you know, greater, is the greatest one. It's only the infinite case where I can have a joint semi-lattice that's not a meet semi-lattice and vice versa. So I can, you know, for that, and for completeness here, the forbidden thing would be just two points that are incomparable and say don't have anything below them. So if I can find something, because basically why if I have a, let's say a finite thing, you know, if I have two points and they always had a bound, I could eventually, all right, that was what it would mean to be. Just rewriting this. That is is almost a trivial case. So these things came up. And furthermore, you know, not just for, for these properties, I guess the last two are not trivial, but for other kinds of special post sets, people keep finding, you know, these forbidden configurations quite often. One looks in order literature, they show up. So the question becomes, you know, what is, is there some, you know, question we're asking is, is there some systematic way of thinking about them? And what does, you know, saying that this thing is a sublattice or sub set have to do with a logical formula? And that was sort of what brings me to the next topic I couldn't talk, which I was saying about these extension properties. At the last conference, I called them lifting, but was corrected that they're really more extension than lifting. Although it's a good thing I said lifting, because that got taught to 
tell me about this beautiful top, some beautiful papers of lifting I'm grateful for. So the mistake has served its purpose, but it's time to correct, to get the little, the technicality right. So we can, oops, okay, oh, only put a little piece. So it's sharpened my chalk, good. So, like I said, here we can sort of see, you know, here I said what made this problematic was that this point was missing. So let me rephrase that properly. Suppose I have a pulsant in there, right? So, let me say, in fact, so I'm saying, if the thing is a lattice, then whenever I can find two points like this, I can find another point which is which I could view as either you know meet of the meet of the top points or joint of the bottom that fills this in. So again. So I'm saying this, okay, I have, I'm given this map, which just picks out such points. Then whenever I, if this thing is the lattice, then the condition is that I must be able to extend that map to this thing, this guy which has this extra point. And conversely, if for every such, if I just had a partially ordered set here, but I could check, but I checked that for every map, every order preserving map that does this, has the extension, then that thing must be a lattice. And that's, you know, in this case, that's just like I said, basically a rewrite, you know, easy to see, it's just a rewriting of the, of the, of what it means to have the meat and joint. All right? But it's written this way. And for completeness, in this case, I could have, of course, said whenever I have, if I, you know, what does it mean for my thing to be bounded from below? Well, whenever I have a map of the discrete pole set with, you know, anti-chain of two elements, in the same way I can lift that up, I can extend it to some lower bound with them. And of course, I, I just don't see how how that map can possibly which one from the x to the x from here to here yeah this is just include these four points as these four points I know but it has lines going down where do the lines go which lines well they're induced right the composition of this with this is that it's a hostile ram right yeah so I'm not showing every possible. I'm just showing a generating set of morphisms it, it, in the lattice. So if I compose this is bigger than this, which is bigger than this, hence this is bigger than this, which is what this line was showing. Uh, so I'm only showing, you know, it's a hostile, which means I only need to, I'm only showing a generating set of, uh, of, inclu of, of inclusions of or morph morphs. We'll think of the category of morphisms rather than showing every possible thing which would get quite cluttered if I had a large post set, I only show a generating set. And then obviously anytime I can follow a path downwards. Oh, so it's an inclusion of a partial different. order, not the inclusion of a graph. Yeah, it's not the inclusion of a graph, it's a group of post sets. Right, okay, sorry. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Right. So yes, with that caveat, right. All right. And so now the question becomes, you know, what, I, what, we, what we found out was that one can actually do the same story down here. And so let's just show you here. It's going to need a little bit. All right, so let me draw it this way. So I'm going to draw the pentagon slightly differently here. It's going to be the same pentagon. You know, it's the same, same post set, just drawn a little differently. Again, 
five points. You can check the, the same thing here, you know, at the bottom and top thing, two on this side, one on that side. I just drew it this way because that makes it easy to show where I can add a point here. And now, I should mention that in this case, there's actually a choice of two ways of doing this. I could have also picked something which had the top point and added a bottom point. And one way of, you know, so one has to say, well, why do I pick one over the other? One way of saying is, let me say that I want my map here to preserve meats. So if I said this was a meat preserving map, then the only way I would be able to complete it would be by adding this thing. If I flipped it upside down, I would be preserving joints and I would be destroying meats. So in fact, for what we're going to do with the modular distributive cases, we actually need to make that choice of, you know, if we're going to do something like this, where I have points, say that I want to, I sort of need to break a tie in between flipping, you know, between the thing that's dual, which I do by saying, do I require joints to be reserved or do I require meats to be reserved? And for the purpose of this talk, I'll take the choice of meats, obviously. If you don't like it, that stand on your head. So we can again check that anytime I have a mod, you know, modular lattice, the reason that this is for, you know, we can say it's forbidden is because if I had such a thing in there as just a meat semi lattice, not a full, full sub lattice, I would be able to add this point. Hence, I can't have this as a as a lattice because of that reason. Do you want the extension to preserve meats and joints? No, just meats, just meats. I don't mean that one down there, I mean the extension. Here. Yeah, up to there. Yeah, yeah it'll still be... Just meat preserving. Right. Because okay. I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm adding in this, this thing as an extra joint. I mean, these two points, okay. right, what happened? These two points originally had that as a joint. Then the new point I added is basically now the, is now the joint of these two. The yeah. joint is no longer top, it's this thing I add. So it can't. Yeah, it can't write. That, and in fact, this is a, well, another point worth recalling is that you want, it's not, you, that it turns out if you take a, you know, a, a map of lattices, basically preserving, being a lattice for morphism, meaning I preserve all meats and joints, means that if the thing originally satisfied the Modular law, then such a map was always mapped it to modular things to modular things and non-modular to non-modular. Likewise, distributed to distributive, non-distributed to distributed. So if you're going to take up something that's a non-modular non lattice and convert it to a modular lattice, so like the map you use must not be able to preserve both meats and joints. To be clear, right? yeah. as long as it's you know, a, yeah. an injection or something like that. Yeah. You can cheat and collapse. So. Right. If you're preserving the structure, you're yeah. going to preserve the properties, right. Right. either positive or negative. Right. That's right. These yeah, properties, modularity and distributivity are preserved just under mappings that a lot of homomorphisms just preserve meets and, jo meets and joints. So that's why if you want to make something that wasn't modular to be modular, you can't use a lot. You have to use something weaker, such as in our case, we say, well, we're only going to preserve the meats. Then one can do that. So here's that. And finally, let me then say there's an analogous picture here. So where, again, if I have a meat preserving map of this into it, I can extend it, in this case, to a cube. So let me draw that. Is this too low for the no, it's not for a viewer? OK. This is a little bigger picture, so I need a little more room. Well, I'll give myself this much room. And Jay just walked in when I'm about to draw his favorite lattice on the board. <laughs> Which lattice? The cube. The five lattice? Or the... the cube. Oh, the cube, yes. Oh, the cube, yes. Yes. <laughs> there we go. So here. I had to add three points to turn this thing into a cube. Where again, it's meat preserving, so these three points go into this bottom layer of three points. 
these guys being the new ones that I just added. All right. So I can show that, again, if my lattice is distributive, then any time I have this as a, as a meet sub-semi lattice, I must have this thing in there. And that's why, in particular, this is not allowed as a sub-lattice. It's not distributive, and therefore, all right. So that's the first thing we notice that, you know, is that, yeah, all these forbidden configurations in all these cases can be um, understood in terms of these extension properties. That the reason a thing is forbidden is because if it occurs, I can extend it. So this is, I guess, I'll put it up now. Clumsily, I'll write extension properties. And then while I'm on this topic, I wanted to mention, all right, so is that whenever we have extension properties like this, so going back sort of to the logic end of it, um, there turns out all these, if I write down, you know, what does this extension property mean as a logical formula, they all wind up being regular logics. So remember, in regular logic, it means that Basically, schematically, my formulas are all of the form. So that for all, for all, yada, 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 there exists a blada such that I have something with one implication. And what does that mean here? Well, you see, the map of this into this is a, for all points here, satisfying some conditions, you know, that this is less than that, the beat of these two is this, etc. Then there must exist this thing, which then, such that on their side the implication, let's say, you know, it dissatisfies, well, property of being the meat of these two, less than that, etc. So all of these have that special form. So that suggests, you know, what were, again, you know, so the for all, quantifies over basically the points in the lower diagram, the exist is whatever I added to complete it, and then these, you know, the conditions in the lower, and then the conditions specifying what the new points do. And this is a fairly well-known general fact that whenever I have such extension things, they always, they tend to correspond to regular logic. Well, these statements are regular logic, no? Sure. So, so well, in some form, they sh yeah, because they're equivalent. That's right. Right. I mean, obviously, uh, as presented, yeah, they're as not. Presented. The lattice law, for example, has for all exists for all. Yeah, so yeah. Here we, you're right. Here we don't have. Yeah, we broke regularity here. Is there equivalent yes. to regular logic yeah. statements, but you have to, you have, have, to, to have to do some work. Yeah. See. Right. Yeah. Right. Is it known what, what the equivalent thing is? The lattice without the... Without the well, the, I mean, the, just we write this thing, just write this as a logical statement, you know, take these for all, these four things, there exists the fifth thing, hmm. such that the fifth thing is bigger than these two and less than those two. Okay. So I can just read it off of this diagram. So the point is that this one is not regular, but I only have four variables, four quantifiers, and. Here, if I, I need a fifth quantifier to at least rewrite a regular thing that's equivalent to it. And furthermore, that, as we said, that equivalence may only be in the finite case. Yeah. So it can be done, and here it is. Right. So it involves that. Okay. So that's one thing. I'm going to say also, to think another way about what these have common is that they're kind of you know, they're local. In the sense that what I'm saying is that if I take my thing I'm probing, I'm only probing, you know, all sort of say pentagon shaped pieces of it. And I'm saying, you know, being modular as a whole is a is I can check locally. I only need to look at each, you know, think of things as basically as a generalized element. Right? So I have a generalized element in the shape of a pentagon or part. So I'm saying for every pentagon that's a part of my thing, I can extend that to this kind of hexagon, etc. So they all have this local property that I'm somehow, you know, somehow probing it locally, and that's at least in the where Gershom and I working at it, we realize that's another nice thing, 
you know, here is that this gives a way of sort of understanding these things in local, so you kind of have, you know, be able to hopefully adapt techniques we have for dealing with local and global things like, you know, sheaf theory, etc., to this. So we have the counter example, yeah. right? We have sure. uh, a yes. Boolean lattice, right. which you can show in where this fails. Yeah, that's right, because Boolean things, you know, it's not local because how do I define Boolean? Well, there, I have not, but that's a global operation. That applies to the whole lattice at once, the not. Or I could try other things like, you know, maybe say, well, I want the, you know, atoms to all cover the bottom order, but that's also a global condition. So no matter how you try to formulate Boolean things, you're going to wind up with some global condition, not just saying that I have, you know, local things or regular I think your knot is upside down. Oh, is it? Yeah. Like that? No. no. <laughs> All right, there's four possibilities. <laughs> no. That no. was my this? No. You got three of them. Uh, right. Top left. Yeah, there we go. No. No, no, it looks no. like a uh, like like pointer. Like this. this. There you go. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right, for those watching at home, be amused. <laughs> <laughs> so one second. So there's no way of describing Boolean logic with with such a pretty diagram. Not as far. No. Oh, interesting. That's interesting. As far as I know, not. You don't have a proof. It just yeah, means but that there's not one. So right. I mean, any up formulation we can find always yeah. involves you know a global thing where I don't just restrict to a fixed size subset, I really have to look at the whole thing. So there's no forbidden configuration yeah. simulation. That's right. Yeah. I mean, obviously, Boolean things are distributive, so this will work. But then the problem is, you know, among distributive lattices, what can I describe? What are the three ways I know describing Boolean? One is, I have a knot. That's a global thing that, that you know, it's an, op it's an operation that acts on the whole lattice. So for, so for all and, x... Well, and let me just mention the sorry. other two. The other two ways I know are, it's a product of, you know, of two element things, but that's decomposes the whole thing as a product. Or that I have atoms, which means you know all joint irreducible elements cover the bottom, which is again global. Sorry, and that's. Um, how do you say a distributive lattice is Boolean? You say for all x there exists an x prime. Yeah. Such that uh, x and x prime is zero. Oh, well, so you need a zero also. You need a. Yeah, which is a specific point in the thing. Because zero is a global thing of the whole. Okay. So it's not a local property in that way. Um, but propositional logic is included in regular logic, so where, where is the... I know this is sophistry, sure. but, but uh, what lattice do you get uh -huh. if you restrict to propositional logic? Propositional logic. Meaning, you okay. know, without a quantifier. Not quite what sure. is propositional logic? What are the oh, operators? It's variables and yeah. uh, connectors. And? Okay, I mean, there are different... Do you join and you, you, do you yeah. use yeah. not or not? Well, I mean... Well, let's let's sure. be clear here. We're not... Not yeah. is, is redundant. We're not taking these logics yeah. and saying this logic gives this lattice. What yeah. we're saying is regular logic right. describe, is the, the logic actions. of describing yeah. these extension diagrams. And each extension diagram corresponds right. to a type of lattice. Yeah. To, or to a property that holds for a type of lattice. I mean, it's true that the logic we're using also happens to be a lattice, but, you know, we well, should, not we, we should keep, be, yeah, keep clear these two different rules of logic. I'm saying, what is the logic I'm using a meta theory to describe my class of lattices? So, so all these things are described by regular logic, and what's, what, what describes Boolean logic? It what? would just be, I guess, good old, you know, some... Large, <coughs> certainly, prop, you know, certainly for sort of logic, but not, not in, not in the right. We're saying as far as any formula, no, it doesn't fit in the regular subset. It's some bigger, right. bigger. It might still be a special subset of first order logic, but not the regular, right. the regular fragment. And geometric logic, or something like that. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know. But as far as we know, it doesn't fit in the regular. And basically, that's intuitively why, because there's no way I can, as far as I'm as we're aware of, 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 you know, writing it formally, and maybe there is somewhere a actual, you know, proof in the logic literature of this, we, I'm just not aware of it. Okay. 
I, it's an algebraic theory, no? I mean, Boolean logic is, a, I mean, it's just a ring, it's the, it's the theory of rings with the yeah, idempotent ring. Sure. Oh, I understand it that way. Yeah. Sure. Oh, wait, sure. So what that's saying is that uh, yeah. being an extension property right. is a surprisingly strong criterion. Yeah. As far as we know, that yeah. that's more restrictive than the just usual. Being equation, yeah, just being equation over. Right. If if the word local, which I've never quite understood mm -hmm. ever. Yeah. If, if the word local mm -hmm. has the usual meaning you either don't understand or recognize okay. or you apply. All right. If these things are local and you mentioned sheaves. Of course, the, one of the points of sheaves is that you can survey obstructions. Mm -hmm. The obstructions are, quote, I don't even like to use the word global. They depend upon the topology of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So, all right, sheaves, mm -hmm. but, you know, the, the whole picture of a particular one might not be mm -hmm. acyclic or homology zero or something like that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's all. Just yeah. so, as soon as you get to sheaves. Well, that's a guiding intuition. Sure, yes. Yeah. Right, and here basically I mean local in the sense that I have this, you know, finite bunch of finite lattices that I use to probe. Okay. Right, the sense that I'm saying, here let's say I probe all pentagon shaped pieces of it. Sure. And for each of them I have this condition. But I don't need an extra condition for involving 7 points, 8 points, 9 points, 10 points. Right, in some setup. Right. right. I'm going to stop now. So I'm just saying I can formulate that. But as far as I'm aware, for Boolean, you know, I need to either do something like the knot, which involves the whole thing, not just the fine subset, or then if I, I may have something like he said with the and and the bottom, but then I need to pick out a special bottom, or it's a global thing. I need to look at the thing as a whole to find out where that zero is. I just want to understand yeah. something a little bit. So, sure. I mean, are we restricting ourselves to the language of Sets, when, you're, when you're making these assertions that... Well, uh, I mean, so I've in other words, a lattice is something that can be described right. as an algebra. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Right. And sure. Mm -hmm. that, that's not using regular logic or anything. That's just finite product logic. Right? Yeah, well, that's right. That, yeah, that, that, sure, if I just... Right, because algebraically, well, well, what's that? Post that I'm saying I take the you know, fundamental operation as the less than relation. And so I can describe the, the in joint terms of that. Well, as algebraic, I would say, well, I've, these two primitives call me and join that satisfy algebraic law. But when you're making these assertions, sure. you are restricting to the language of post. Yeah, I've been okay. using that all along. Sure. Okay, I just want to. Yes, okay. that's right. The reason is because, yeah, basically these mappings are going to be, you know, all at the very least, or at least order preserving. Okay. They may be more like meat preserving, but right. okay. basically the category in which I'm drawing all these diagrams is category of post sets. Okay. That's, so one way to think yeah. about this is that, you know, we're not doing sort of the theory of algebraic structures. Yeah. We're doing um, you know, uh, zero one category theory, right? That's sort of the, the way to think about it. Yeah. And these these extension diagrams right. are uh, like baby uh, count extensions. Mm -hmm. That's so, right. Yeah. yeah, that's right. I mentioned a few words at the beginning. Thank you for bringing that up again. That yeah, that is the point of view on this. So it's also in particular different from the point of view of taking free things and quotienting them were really you know, in this way. Okay, so having said a few words about this, I guess I'll now turn, unless I forgot something, to the next topic, which is the idea of the extension. So we see it in, in its embryonic form here, right? This thing was not a modular lattice, but when I added this point, I got a modular lattice. This was not a lattice, I added a point, it became a lattice. This was not distributive, I added three points, it became distributive. So, you know, one natural question is, from this way, to put it, is, well, suppose I didn't just have this, these simple little pulse sets with five or six points, suppose I had some much bigger one. Could I add points to them in a systematic way to make, to make them, you know, to make, say, modular law or distributive law or whatever hold, if it didn't necessarily hold for the original thing? And, which is the idea of a completion. Roughly speaking, now I said, as far as how we got to it, actually that's where we started asking a question which led us to, to this formulation. So now let me, yeah, so let me head off something at the pass. Sure. And note that 
the confusion we had at first, and that seems to come up in presenting this, yeah. is we need to very firmly distinguish right. completions from um, free structures, which again is right. the typical thing you yes. would do. And so um, a completion is, and Ray's going to do it categorically, but the point is uh, yeah. that it's idempotent, and it gives you sort of a minimal universal thing that stuff factors through, as opposed to a free structure, which sort of gives you the largest thing that you can quotient everything down from. So. Right. So we're basically working with inclusions rather than quotients and not right because there's, there's a theory of you know free lattices yeah. and free distributive lattices. Right. This is the exact opposite thing. This is sort of the the smallest, right. tightest thing you, you can do. That um, that the that, that what you had embeds into. So yes. they're also called envelopes sometimes in the order theory. Yeah, right. Um, That's right. So yeah. So let me be. So basically, or holes. Right. Yeah. So sure. Hole. Right. Hole. H U L L. Yeah. I mean, oh, that's okay. all, as, in, okay. as in convex hole. Yeah. Okay. As in okay. convex hole, right. yeah. which is the smallest convex thing that uh, yeah. contains your thing. Okay. So the idea is that, yeah, like I said, it's basically that, yeah, we're doing free things, you're, you're thinking of quotienting free things to get your thing back, whereas here we're thinking of what can we include our thing yeah. into. So in other words, if I'm given an X, you know, the free stuff. I go this way, whereas here yes. we're, we're going into that way. The arrow points yeah, yeah. in the opposite direction. Yeah. All right, so now let me, so to begin with, let me say the two known cases of this. Or start with actually the trivial case. Since I put up this, you know, bounded poset thing, well, it's pretty, if we wanted something to be bounded from below, it's pretty obvious what I need to do, right? I need to, if it doesn't have lower bounds, add them. In fact, I only need one lower bound. If I just add a bottom to it, well, that's going to be an up lower bound of any two things already in there, right? right? So, so, so trivial is bounded at bottom if It doesn't have block. Now, what is the sense that it's just minimal? It's pretty obvious. Let's say I had a post set. You know, I could, you know, let's add this post set. Of course, I could have said, well, I said, well, first, you know, I add these points. Okay, these had upper bound. Oh, but these didn't have a lower bound. I did this. Right. Or I could have just directly said, just add the one bottom. And then pretty clearly, this thing includes into there. Because you know, if I keep adding bounds, I'll eventually get a bottom element. I guess I do kind of backwards. I could, and then what I could claim is that, look, if I had any complete, any mapping of my thing into a, you know, bounded lattice, it would have to factor to this. Because what does factoring to this mean? It means I have the original thing, and I have that. So in other words, given any map from Let's say this particular guy into a bounded poset. That map must factor to that. Just which in this case is just saying that if I make the thing bounded from below, it's going to have to have a bottom, and that's all it needs to have. Now, so that's the trivial case. Trivial case. Now the next case, which is a non-trivial one. Right, the only difference between that and that is one has two and one has three. So that's say, right. You can say you say if there's an arbitrary number of elements. Yeah. There's and a bottom. That's okay. right. And in fact, so let me draw a more general thing. Let's add a post set. Then what I'm really saying is that I post set, you know, plus pop any given any post set whatsoever, but just with an, an example. Or two examples of if I have an order preserving map of that into a bounded thing, that must factor to that plus bottom, say if it didn't have a bottom already. This is a oh, yeah. So it's a simple case of saying here's how I complete it by if it didn't have a bottom, I add a bottom. And then I can 
it has this universal property, which is that, well, given any mapping of that into a bounded thing, or a preserved map, it must factor to that. And the story will then be that for each of, for the other guys, well, we don't know it yet for the modular law, but it's known, what's known, let me first go, is known that in the case of mapping posa into a lattice or a lattice and distributive lattice, not just for these two simple cases, but for anyone, there is going to be a unique thing to which they all factor. And so let me now describe the, the two known completions, namely the one for, um, for a lattice and for distributive. All right, so I'm going to delete this to make room because I'm trying to slowly turn this all into a table with several columns, the next column of which is the completion. So I'll, so here, so I'll just write them. So for a bounded case, it was, that was a sort of trivial one. Then for a distributive case, the generalization of this is, and if I remember, McNeil is with an A? Yeah, McNeil. Okay. Yes. Okay, good. I got that right. So this was due to Dedekind and McNeil, and I'll describe what the construction goes in a moment. And then there's also, for the case of distributive, it's also known, was due to, it's due to McNeely, but it's called von Flaxer, because they independently... Right. Well, let me tell you, the, yeah, let me get to this. Yes, there's a bit of a story there, so I'll, which I'll say at some point. Here... So a modular case, we suspect there is one, we're working on it, but we haven't, you know, found it yet. But we think that some of this, these principles will help us find it, and I'll say a few words about our thing. So, yes. Yeah, the story is actually that, well, this thing goes back to the idea of Dedekind. So McNeil was a student of Gerd Berkhoff, and he was you know, studying, I guess, around the 30s or so. Mm -hmm. And in his thesis, he asked exactly about this question of, that we were asking here about completing lattices. And so he showed, you know, actually a completion of a thing to a, of a posa to a lattice and a completion of a non-distributive lattice into a, into a distributive lattice. Now, since this completing into a lattice is used a lot, people remembered it, it used the idea of the cut, so it got known, generally known as the Dedekind McNeil thing. His completion distributive thing got forgotten. Then, in the 1970s, Bruns and Waxer came along and rediscovered, and I will mention their construction. And then, you know, and it was only around, what was it, 2012 or so, very recent, someone knows, hey, Bruns and Waxer rediscovered something that was already in McNeil's thesis. <laughs> and Gershom and I even, you know, stumbled on this on our own before we actually found out Bruns and Waxer. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, so unlike these, for Vim configurations, which are, you know, widely known in plenty of examples, this business of the completions has been relatively unstudied. And so, all we know so far of it are these two cases. So let me first describe the Dedekind McNeil completion. So, give the classical version. So I'm going to give the classical versions of those and then describe how we, in terms of our extensions, can understand them and actually derive the, derive them. Okay, so, Dedekind McNeil. So the reason Dedekind got his name was because one of the famous things Dedekind, Dedekind is famous for is showing how I complete the, you know, rational numbers into real numbers using cuts. And basically, the, that cut only depends on the order property of the real numbers, so it can be applied to any post set whatsoever. And so let me just remind you of, remind you of that thing which everybody knows from you know basic analysis right that so what is that it's simply a pair so let's have so first I have post it P P right so it, or put that up here so then P. 
All right, so it just means I have, in fact, I should say the, so I have two subsets which partition my poset, and not just any old partition into two subsets, but one where every element in U, which I'm, is greater than every element in L. Hence the letters U for upper and lower. So there. Just say, just say it again, please. Well, I have a partition into two L, two subsets. So the underlying set is partitioned yeah, into yeah, two. Yeah, that's right. Take the underlying non-empty non subset. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, non-empty yeah. ones such that that's why I use the strict subset here. Okay. So I they're just, not I empty. See that far. But go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So I didn't put the equal sign under it. Okay. They're strict subsets such that every element of this, and there's at least one, is greater than every element of that, of which there's also at least one. Is that correct? Yeah. Your definition is formally correct. Yeah, that's, de <laughs> that's a definite <laughs> cut. Sure. Was asking. That's all. That's it, yes. Okay. okay. And then what you can show is that, well, these things also form a partially ordered set. Under sure. Where the order is given by right. set inclusion. Sure. Furthermore, um, if this thing is a partially, if P is partially ordered, then this thing is in fact a lattice. So, to begin with, if P was a lattice, right. you see then given two such sets, what would happen? Well, all the L's are upper bounded in the U's, so hence the, you know, if P is a lattice, right, then obviously I could just as well, I could have taken the join of the meat of the upper guys or the join of the lower guys, and that would be the point in between them. So I would have, you know, that the meat of... Well, in fact, there I could... Okay, I can have them insert this joint. Oh, sorry, yeah. A lower thing, right. and you would be the downset of that point. Let's call that x. Then you would be the the up set of x in order to all things bigger, to, bigger or equal than x, and v would be equal to, I mean l, would be equal to the down set of that point x. Okay. And the idea is that if your p was not a lattice, then by adding these Dedekind cuts in, I, I basically, this serves as a proxy for that point that may not be there. Okay. And it's again a generalization you can see of this. Right here I have, I have a Dedekind cut, namely, here my upper set are these upper two points, lower set are these two points. I'm missing this point, which is going to be well it's described as the, the meet of the top points or the join of the bottom points. And so this is just an extension to more points, if you will. It's a generalization of that. So one can just check that, you know, if P is any post set, then the Dedekind cuts form a, you know, form a, form a lattice. I have, and I have extent, natural embedding of my, well, this gives me a natural embedding given any point. I have a Dedekind cut, which is just upset. Given any point x, I have a Dedekind cut given by that, right? Mm -hmm. Where I just take the, for the down set, I take down set of x, up set of x. As I pointed here, if the thing was already a lattice, then this, you know, this embedding would be just an isomorphism. But if it's not a lattice, this adds new things that weren't there. So it basically systematically adds a minimum number of these points such that I create a lattice of something that was not already a lattice. Which again, I could, you know, express that property in terms of a diagram of saying if I have a the ordered thing, send it into a lattice with an order preserving map. Or, or I should be careful. We want it to be a map that preserves the existing means. Mm -hmm. Think here. Let me uh, yeah, give uh, myself a little say what I was going to say. So whereby this, I just mean this, this Dedekind McDeal completion, I the P bar means that completion. So the, the lower map. Yeah. Okay. So the lower 
format preserves the POSAT relation. Yes, I should def at least be ordered preserved. The lower one preserves. Yeah. And okay. But you also said preserves any existing meat Yeah, that's a uh, that's, that's a why I need to remember. Different Let's see, I just forgot. Which condition. one would I want for this one? Um, I or? think for DM it does preserve all existing meats. And okay. Bones. This is in the literature. Okay. okay, it is that. That's why I thought here. Yeah. So for a lower map, I'll pick one of those. Right. And it's a, it's a and theorem. And in fact, both, because yeah. of what Yeah, yeah, right. That, that way, for this, yeah, this setup with finite case, especially if you have one, you get the other. Just, just to yeah, review, so. you, you formally define something called the dedicated McNeil completion. Right, it just means yes. It and means given a post, the completion is the post set of all dedicated cuts. Right, but then, then you get this uh, diagram, the following facts about the diagram right. are that yes. if they're existing, there are existing meats and existing joints. Yeah. They are preserved. Yeah. In some sense. Right. Pick a map which pick a map which preserves them. Right. That map must factor to this completion. Right. That's a theory. And the cannot and this canonical uh, conclusion. Yes. Right. And and it right. also therefore holds that uh, the map from uh, the post set into the completion will also preserve meats and yes. existing joints. Yes. Okay. If they exist already. Okay. And the right. second map, the the, right. the up the upper half of the triangle, that's a uh, lattice homomorphism. So that preserves all meats and joints. Yeah. Okay. So it's very strong. Right. That's right. So there's, yes, yeah, so that's this construction. All right. Okay. So then let me next, I guess, before going further, then describe what Brun, two, two versions of Brun's Laxer okay. construction. One, the, first the original one by Brun's and Laxer. Okay. So what they did, yeah, sorry. So remember, what they wanted to do was take something that was not distributed and make it distributed. Ah, okay. So their way of doing that was to say, well, maybe there are subsets for which the distributive law holds. So what they did was say, look at it. Subset S. <coughs> maybe I'll give myself a little tighter here and ignore the board boundaries. Laxer. Such that for all X in the process. They assume they're in a meat semi lattice. Yeah, okay, yeah. sure. Let's assume we have meats already. Yes, in their case, they needed, yeah. Okay. They were complete with at least the semi lattice. Okay. You're right. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a few comments. What? Fine. X, so distributive means what? Right. So, so I just that. assume. The joint yeah. is the big joint. Yeah. So, so the joint is every element of the set. Right. So I'm just saying that here, you know, in the case of joining all the elements of S, I can distribute meat with with that with for any X, I can distribute meat with that over that joint mm -hmm. for that set S. Okay. So consider all such sets. And then that forms, all right. Well that forms some, you know, subset of the order, you know, the Subset of the power set of my right. original lattice, okay. Okay. right? So this thing is clearly, all right. Furthermore, one furthermore, then they check that this thing is actually not just you know. So with the ordering being set inclusion, furthermore, they check that this happens to be not just you know a sub both set. It's actually a sub lattice. In fact, a sub distributive a distributive lattice. Got it. Of that. Well, it's not sub distributed lattice because that's, it's this thing is Boolean, hence, or right. right. fortiori right. distributive. Well, okay. So they check that. I'm not going to try to even say why, just okay. this is their original construction. Okay. So it kind of is, you know, their way of trying to, so intuition is okay, they want to make the thing distributive, so they say take all subsets for which I already have distributivity and those form it, and I have an inclusion into there, I guess. You know, of given a set, I can include into that right, singleton right. or whatever that, that gives me a canonical embedding. And check that the thing was already distributed. This would not give me anything new. Because I think the S would, would all be downsets or something. So that was their construction in the 70s, which did it. Now, based on, you know, a certain other theorem of Burkhoff that I didn't mention here. In last theory, when Gershom I look at, we also know another way of getting this kind of a completion. Okay. Which is to say, so let's call this, so in fact, we call this 
So that's one description of my completion here. Yep. So let me first write it and then explain my notation, our notation, the notation here, which is standard and order theory. Is consider okay. Well, I mean, oh, so what do I mean here? Where J means P consistent here. So meaning, when I say J of P, I mean take the set of all joint irreducible elements of P, where joint irreducible simply means that I cannot write the thing as a joint of anything, you know, you know just write the definition. Joint irreducible means I have, the J is not going to be your favorite definition, it's going to be the literal one. <laughs> but, so given X and P, I call it joint irreducible if whenever I can write is joint irreducible if whenever I can write x as join of some mm -hmm. some set, then I can only do that when x is already an element of the set. So that's what I mean by reducible. I can't, you know, by taking joint, I can't reduce it into the join of something smaller. Whenever I take write as a join, it's gonna, it's still gonna be in there. So that's a joint irreducible. Right. So I said take the set of those, and uh, you know, it's a subset, and an ordered subset, then by O I simply mean, so O of P, me, O of, or of X, let's say, where X is an ordered set, means the set of all down, down close sets of X. Oh, okay. All right. So I take that, take all down sets of joint irreducible. And first of all, it's a well, and, you know, no, known fact going back to Burkhoff that no matter, down sets of any ordered set are, a dis, are a distributive lattice. Finitely, this is finite. Yeah, finite. In the finite, I'm, that's right. So I caveat my back beginning that everything by default is assumed finite. Oh, okay. If not stated okay. explicitly otherwise. So yes, certainly in the finite. So then for finite ones, yeah, all down sets are always distributive. All right. So this is at least the distributive lattice. Now why it's a completion? Well, okay, first thing we know is that P itself was already distributive. By another result of Burkhoff that I just briefly alluded to earlier, I would get back the same thing. If, if P was already distributed, the downsets of the joint irreducibles are known to give me back the P I started with, when P is a distributive lattice. Okay. But what we noted was that if P was not distributive, and not even maybe not even a lattice, just a post set, right. in which case joint irreducibles means obviously here I may not always have a joint. But that's fine. The condition said if x equals a join of something, x must belong to that set. Right. And that solution that could be satisfied trivially because maybe x can't be one of the join of anything other than a single thing. Right. Okay. And that's okay too. That's a join irreducible. That join irreducible. I can't reduce it into a join of anything. Right. Understood. So that's fine. So this makes sense there, and in fact, it gives us a version of you know this completion that is actually goes directly from any ordered set to a distributive lattice. Any finite? The finite one set. set. Well, yeah, that's right. Let's not worry about the infinite extensions for now. Let's just say, certainly in the finite case, it goes directly from ordered set in one step to distributive right. lattice. Okay. Now, it would be the same as if you had taken the two existing things and first used the dedicate cuts to take you to a lattice. Then the original thing by Bruns and Laxer, which to take you from a lattice, the ah, rest of the That's way. a theorem. Yeah. Okay. And in fact, it's it will follow from and it will fact from the fact that this also has a universality property. Okay. So basically, they both satisfy the same universality property, hence they must be the same thing. Where it's gonna take the same form. Well, it's the same diagram as here, but where now this is the, you know, now gonna be this Bruns. Yeah. Uh, the lots are completion, and this is going to be distributed. And here I'm going to have, I have to be put a different type of morphism, so it's going to preserve meets and only certain joints. Because as we said, remember, before I said preserving all meets and joints, if the thing is distributive, then it forces the other guy to be distributive as well. 
So that couldn't possibly take a non-distributive thing to a distributive thing. So we need to only, so we can't preserve all meats and joints. So what we do is we said, well, we'll preserve all meats, but only some joints. Say what, it again. What do you mean by that? What, well, what does that mean? Well, okay. There. Well, so okay, we can. I'll start making it more specific. I can give a, in yeah. the Bruns Schachter right. construction is yeah. the easier one to describe. Okay, sure. Um, it preserves only those joints that actually satisfy that distributive criteria given above. Uh -huh. um, yeah. So sure. that's so easy go. to see. Yeah. Now, in the other setup, when you're completing yeah. any coset, right. which is one where you might not have all these yeah. to begin with, you're not starting yeah. with a semi lattice, um, you preserve yeah. a, sort of a funny gadget that it's maybe not worth going through, but that we worked yeah. out that we call maximal joins, right. and they're um, right. joins in which there's essentially no intermediate um, guys. Right. So they're joins... Well, I can draw the... Yeah, let me, let me explain the what they are. So what they are is, I have a join, let's have a set S. Mm -hmm. And for in, listen, let me just assume that S is down closed for mm -hmm. simplicity. Because obviously I'm taking it's join, adding things below it doesn't change the join. So what I could ask is, okay, I've gotten, you know, join S. Mm -hmm. Now suppose I took something which was strictly less than join S, call it X. Then I want to know that that X, you know, I want to know that, that in a distributive lattice, mm -hmm. I would have the property that X is actually the join of um, mm -hmm. S, the part of S that's below X. And a non-distributive lattice, it's not. And in fact, here's the first example. Suppose I picked this S here, right? I, let's say I picked just these two points as B my S. Here's an X, another X that's strictly below that. But it's not the join of anything in here. And one can show it goes both ways that, you know, from the distributive law, it's easy to check this. And one can also then show that if a lattice has this property, it must be distributive. If for all, if for all sets, their is. joints have this property. Right. So the That's morphisms right. preserve all meets and joins only with that property. Right. That's right. And this was what I was talking about special downsets, yes. Okay. That's right. So this is, that's right. So if I have, yes, I can show, let me just. Write that down here as a theorem. If and only if. Um, So for all the downsets in L, mm -hmm. this property holds that if X is less than their intersection, then X is, in fact, the join of the part of S below it. Mm. So one can so so I guess this gives us a third character, not yet another characterization of distributed lattices because we started with the formula, we went to a forbidden configuration, turned it to extension property, and now we have a can also characterize the thing in terms of a condition on downset. And one could, as a simple exercise, in fact, characterize bounded posets and lattices in a similar way as, you know, as you bound target. In a similar, as some property on downsets. But here's where it's interesting because then that property tells us which, when we draw this diagram, which, which joins we want that, want the morphism to preserve. Which will, okay, bring me to the next topic. And so one thing I should emphasize is that, you know, I forgot to say this at the category fest is, so one thing we noticed is that, you know, when we take our, by defining it this way, as I said, I can write the completion one step going from an ordered set to a, to a distributive lattice. Furthermore, even in that case, it will satisfy this universal property where this must then, where in the case of order set, this must be only interpreted, you know, as joints that, that already exist. So I don't need to check, you know, where 
the act as exists in yoga. And that's also why one, you know, the, the general, way, the abstract way of seeing why these two complete different things must actually be the same. Because they both satisfy the same universal property. Whatever I can put there is the front of the isomorphism, whether I happen to write it this way or that way. So that's the thing. Okay. Okay, I'm doing okay, I have a little more time, so let me just so let me just say kind of as a byway before going further to the next topic is also one thing we found and proved was an analog of this for for the modular lattice. Mm -hmm. So let me at least you know, just for the record, state that property is that for all, so again, I have a set S, I pick an element X less than joint, but now I'm going to have a more restrictive condition, namely, which I can write, okay, let me just write the way I have it. So no, this is a Puzio Bazerman completion or something. Well, we, don't have yeah, we, we, we only have so far the special the theorem on downsets. We don't yet have a completion. We're working on it. So, but we hope that this might be at least you know a first step towards a completion because one could you know this at least tells you something about what sort of morphisms maybe you should put in there that, that, that should factor to your completion. So it's another characterization theory. Right. Exactly. Go to x. And oops, must be yeah, x. Uh oh, I have a misprint here. I'm not going to remember what that no, no, oh, that's right, x, it must be that, okay, that thing. Okay, so it's a bit of a mouthful or an armful uh -huh. or a handful to write, but basically the new element I have here was, so before I just had this, x was, Intersection down. The new element I've added here is I consider also the set of x that are not comparable to x, meaning they're neither you know less than, nor equal, nor greater than x. And I basically okay. And then I add those to condition. And let me intuitively mention why why wouldn't we want this? Well, remember from the bar, this is an example, the simplest exa example of something that's modular but not distributed. And here what happens is you see I might want to pick, as I said, my s to say be these things and leave out this as my x. So the point is the reason it's okay to leave this s out because it, basically it's not comparable to these guys. So since it's not comparable, I don't have to impose on it this condition that it's to join them in each subset of them. And that's you know, yeah. Because we could write the other thing, I guess I should say that, yeah, to join of, let me write it, let me rewrite this thing in a, at least a notation that looks a little bit more like what I have there, instead of this funny shorthand. Uh, join of. Why? Right. Yes, x equal. Right, we have, oh yeah, I'm sorry, we have either, I forgot, the same condition we had before. Sorry. So, point is for the x, I either have the condition I before that it happens to be a join of things, or if it's not, then it has to have this disjointness property from the s. Just, 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 yeah. that is a 
less than but not equal to. Right, on that line. Yeah, that's, it's just that's yes. just incomparable to. Incomparable to. No, no, I'm talking about First to the left. Yeah, the left. it's a less so than one line. One yeah. line. That thing. Oh, that thing, yeah. What is that? Strictly less than or less than or equal is what he said. Well, I run as a strictly less than, but we should double check. Okay. Maybe yeah. maybe out of misprints. Okay. Maybe an equal I in the Okay. In the slides I made up I had it that way, so Okay, okay. Yeah. So we what we did was we we proved a similar characterization that this property for all subsets S is right. equivalent to a thing being modular. Got it. Hence, I suggest that one may want to look at maps to preserve that. Absolutely. Okay. So having said that, yes. Yeah, so having said that, let me just think. There's not much. Well, there's a little bit of time. So let me just think what I was going to do next. I had yeah I had the sorry oh reflectors reflect yeah yeah thank you reflectors that's right. So, yeah, so, which is actually one of the reasons I want to mention these things with the cat with the special downsets, because the special down, the idea was special downsets told me which joins I want to preserve to stay within a certain type of special poset. All right, so, uh, let me, let me erase this. So great, my table is going to fill, this is actually good timing. By the end of the talk, the table will fill up the board. Okay? So, sort of added my, let me say here, like my, you know, okay, downset style, special downsets here, you know, here. All right. So, let's just say that they were, let's just say in this case, what I call the modular downset. The distributive one were modular down set and distributive down set are just my short code words for these whatever these condition conditions that showed up that this is the condition a down set's almost satisfied for a thing to be distributive or modular. And as I said, then we have morphisms that preserve those. Alright? So now what we can do is we can actually, you know, look at this problem of, like I said, say, of, of one of these problems of, you know, completing things. So let's say I want to go from, say, lattice, posets to lattices, like in the original Dedekind McNeil. So what I can do is I'm, you know, I'm going to go basically in two steps. So let me just draw the thing and then explain what I mean. So the idea is that lattice is obviously a special type of pulsate, right? But then I'm going to do is to mm -hmm. so I'm going to basically say that I have the category of all lattices. That's a subcategory of all pulsates. But I'm going to cook up an intermediate category, which I call J and post, join me post it. So what do we mean by that? We mean that the objects of this are all post sets, same as the objects here. But, the, but I restrict the morphisms to ones that preserve joins and meets, which mean that, that this is a, you know, if I pick objects here, they're a harm set, the morphisms here are just a harm set over there. So this is kind of an, kind of an amphibian halfway <laughs> between the lattice and the post set. It sort of has, the objects of post sets, but only the morphism of lattices. In other words, the morphisms must preserve all existing meets and joints. All right, so that means yes, so. Which one, which one of those functors are faithful? The left or the right? Uh, let's see, well, this is, is a full thing. Inclusion. This is a full subcategory, because right. it keeps all things. Right. And then here, well, this one preserves all the objects, but but can make the home sets bigger. So I don't know if that happens. That is faithful. That's, that's, that's faithful. Yeah, yeah that's faithful. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Is this thing needs some joints. Let me just put it that way. So that's what I mean here. Then what I notice is that if I look at my completion, well, that that it can make feel was you know, completing here. Well, well it's completing post sets into it, but really I should, well, not quite, because actually as I said when I drew that, or diagram that I erased here, 
for the completion. Remember, if I went from posa to a lattice, I wanted this to be a thing that preserved existing meets and joints. Yeah. So my completion is actually a map that goes from this intermediate thing to the full thing. I mean, given a posa as a as an object, it completes it, but it only the only thing that's going to lift are the are these special morphs, not any order, any old order preserving map. So this is this. I'm calling these mappings. Yeah, I forget who wrote the paper, but I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's a series of ideas, I guess, where okay. typically mm -hmm. injective envelopes or the like are not functorial. Mm -hmm. um, for, so, for example, that it can make the whole completion on post sets. Mm -hmm. It's not a functor itself. Right. But, yeah. So, I mean, you do, yeah, that kind of forces you to. Look that, at but the nice thing is, once you restrict it, it's not just a functor, it's yes, also it's adjoint. adjoint to yeah. the inclusion. Yeah. yeah. And it's a reflective and subcategory. So you get a reflector, right. Sure, so you get a reflective yeah. subcategory. Yeah. And, yeah. Right. And the same story will hold also for the, you know, Brown's Laxer thing, where now it's here, I mean, by J, I mean only these. The special joins are preserved, and we, you know, believe that a similar thing should be holding for modular thing with, but we haven't proven it yet. So this is the next part of the story. We found that yes, you get this. And in fact, there's a known there's a paper we read called Dedekin McNeil's Reflector, mm -hmm. and here's how here's where that fits into the picture. Mm -hmm. So you have these special morphisms. Then once you have them, the nice thing is you get these intermediate categories and these hybrid things then have a adjoint, then the completions in that thing are adjoint to the inclusion. All right? So finally, what I'm going to wrap up with is, you know, I was saying that here, the reason we wanted this, one of the reasons we liked this was because somehow this thing was local. It was basically saying, here's the extension on the smallest non-trivial thing. And the question is, Somehow the idea was to say, well, we know you could characterize them by that, by saying that if all the, you know, a thing is either a lattice, modular lattice, distributive lattice, if and only if, each of the smallest things completes. So a natural thing is to ask, is there a way then of somehow taking the completion of each of these little pieces and turning them into the universal completion of the whole thing? And so what I'm going to outline for you pictorially is how that gives us Dedekin and McNeil from just knowing this. Because remember the original definition involved Dedekin cuts, which were these global things where I had to partition the whole the whole pole set. And now I will actually say if you didn't know about them, how you could actually derive them just from from this kind of local thinking. So alright, so I'll do that here and that will we'll wrap up today's lecture. So, first thing, so the idea will be, as I mentioned, first of all, going back. In this, I wanted to, you know, think in terms of these mappings as, you know, well, in the lower cases, I needed to make that choice of do I preserve all meets and do I preserve all joints. And let me work with that and say I preserve meets. Now, see, a nice thing is if I work, like I said, the finite case being a lattice is same as being a meat semi lattice, so I could just as well talk about the Dedekin McNeil completion of the meat semi lattice. All right, let me do it. Now, a nice thing about being a semi lattice is that then any downset of a semi meat semi lattice is still a meat semi lattice. So, what that suggests is a kind of induction, namely given. A close at P, right? We have it's we have you know have all the downsets of P, which is opposite. So suppose so in here I can pick a maximal chain of, of downsets. Alright? So Chain, call it, I don't know. Okay. And the nice thing about, you know, maximal chains is, well, that's how you usually, you can do an induction. 
because I've got a chain, so I can induce, hopefully, do induction up the chain. So basically, the idea will be that, you know, on the bottom of the chain, I'm going to have something like the empty, you know, the empty subset. Oh. Did I, I think you need, the chain is not an element of O of B, it's an element of P of O of B. So Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Subset of O of P, yes. Subset, I meant. Not element. Excuse me. The yeah, maximum chain, which is a subset of it. So at the bottom of the, the idea is that, well, at the bottom of an anti-chain, I'm going to have the empty subset. Above that, all the singletons and so on. So the idea is, well, I certainly can complete an empty thing because there's nothing to do. And singletons are already complete. So the idea is, you know, maybe I can do an induction where I, I can show, construct the thing inductively one step at a time. So let me first say, you know, now again, assuming the thing is finite, so obviously maximal chains by Zorn lemma will exist, you know, any time where we allow axiom of, of choice or that, but let's say if it's finite, I can be explicit what a maximal chain of downsets is. It's very simple. So suppose I have, you know, suppose that S is, let's say, prime, S and S prime, or in this chain, and of S. Okay? So it's a subset, and you know, being a maximal, being the next thing in a maximal chain means I can't put anything in between them. So the only way I could do that is that S prime is S with one point added. And that point must obviously, you know, have no, well, so S prime must equal to S plus some extra point. Furthermore, there must not be any Y, anything low S, X must already have been in S. Because otherwise I could have picked something lower and it wouldn't have been a maximal. It wouldn't have been one step in the maximal. Yeah, you just, just proven the Jordan uh, theorem. Oh, okay, Jordan. Yeah. All right, there's, there we go. All right, so we can add another good. So that's X where, the downset of X belongs to S. But obviously X doesn't belong to S otherwise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. You're finishing up? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah, I'm finishing up and I'll take you. So what ah, I do. Okay. Great. So I do is that. Now, let me just notice another fact about this thing. So suppose I have inside my post set. Anti chains such that every guy in the uh, in the upper guy is bigger than every guy in the one underneath it. All right. Was there anti chains? Yeah, one anti chain, another anti chain. Okay. So everything in the upper anti chain is bigger than everything in the lower anti. -chain. And in fact, these were late to then cuts because this would be the anti-chain of bottom elements of the top thing, top elements of the lower guy, if you think about it for a few moments. All right, so I have two such anti-chains. So let's have an anti-chain. Chains L, where every X in U covers every Y and L, like the one I do. Mm -hmm. All right? So first point I'll notice is that if I do this kind of induction, the order of the points I must pick will first, at some point, give me all these points of the bottom end touch, and only later start putting these things. Because if I put any of these in, I couldn't have put that later because that's less than this. That wouldn't right. work with this Jordan one. Okay, so I've gotten, so at some point, some place in this maximal chain will have the whole lower thing. And then I'll add one point of the upper thing. Well, that's fine. No problem. It's still less because I only one point. 
So point I'll add another point. Now I'm in trouble because I've got two things here which are, say, yeah. both upper bounds. Yeah. And therefore, my completion told me I needed to add mm -hmm. this point in. Now, next time I might go and say, oh, but well, what about this point here I already had? Well, I could have had, you know, again, I also have this is bigger than all of them. So I better add another point here. But what can I do? I can say, aha, now I've created this guy. Right? If I take these two points and these two, that again is inconsistent because each of these is right. more least. Oh. So I now need to add this point. But let me make an observation now. <laughs> if I've done that, you know, had I taken, um, which way do I like to write this? Included, okay, included into that would be the thing where I had only added the middle point. So if I had taken yeah. this thing where I had the two amp, these two, and I had added that point, I could have only taken that. Because this includes into there. Understood. And it preserved meat because the only meat I have is the meat of these two points is the new meat I put in. And that maps to that. So that's a meat preserving map. Great. Now, what I can do is, like I said, let's say my thing is bigger, and I start adding more points, I can keep, completing, keep continuing this procedure. So I've completed it. I said, well, I don't need this point, but now if I added this thing, well, I'd have to continue and add more of them. But I could add, then I could, you know, take only the top one I added. So at the end of the day, as I continue this inductive procedure, when I, by the time I put all the, the, bot, the, end of, the end game will be that I had, in the end, I said, well, I found out that in the universal completion, so I take these steps where I keep completing these, you know, these little bow ties, and but then I also alternate with saying, well, when I, you know, co consolidate some of them by saying I take the my map it through the thing that only has one. So at the end of the day of doing that over and over again, I will have found out that given these anti chains, all of them map from this one where I've added only one point. But what is that? That's exactly the dedicament deal, because I, my upper lower set, I completed it by adding this cut, by adding exactly one point in between. So the idea is that doing this induction, I started with the thing where I only told you how to complete one of these subsets of four, but by repeatedly doing that and um, pruning away points by, by, you know, picking, by factoring them to some mapping, I, I come across the universal thing, which was the original dedicated the clean that was defined in terms of this global thing with the upper and lower set. And so what we're hoping to do is for the modular and distributive case, you know, see that, that this also works. So we already know what the completion is here. And here we're hoping that by, you know, take by taking this idea and working with it and some related ideas, we would we should be able to generate a you know, if it exists, find a modular completion. We've at least checked a lot of cases, seen in those cases what the modular completion would be for some concrete lattices, but we still haven't proven a general result yet. And that's what we're working on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> any questions? It's late. <laughs> So I don't have any questions, but I've got 10 rants. But, but if you have answers, wait, 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 no, no, but I'm not going to bring up any of them. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>